Julian Porter over lunch said that he would rather not be chairman of this session because he wants to be more partisan and, <laughs> and uh, aggressive than you might be if you were chairman. So I ended up with the job assigned to me over lunch. And as you all know, Julian is a very persuasive person. You don't say no. Um, in some ways, the theme of this uh, whole day is times they are changing. And when we get into the issue of immoral behavior, it's more so than perhaps anything else. And some of it is remarkably subtle for some of us. For example, if you were attentive to the vocabulary of the panelists this morning, you might have noticed that the vast majority of the pronouns that were used with reference to people in power were masculine pronouns. The complainant was generally he, uh, the, the accused rather was the professional was generally a he, the prosecutor was generally a he. Um, there was an assumption that the that the persons wielding authority or having professional status were males. And I, do, it's, I don't put a lot of consequence into it other than to say that we are in a period of transition in terms of understanding the subtleties of um, what's happening. And not all of us are catching up at the same speed. As a consequence, even the vocabulary of 1985 or 1987 may not be entirely functional in 1993. And what we're going to spend a little time on in the panel this afternoon is um, attempting to give practitioners uh, some idea as to the changing climate with regard to the standards that are being applied by professional bodies to professionals on the issue of uh, behavior. And uh, the climate in the proceedings relating to behavior. That is to say, what's actually happening there? And uh, we're going to start, if I can, with, the, with uh, Julian. Um, drawing on his experience, and I'm not going to read you, I mean, we're just a small group of friends here, and the, the CVs of all of your speakers are there. I think most of you know many of the people who are on the panel in any event. Julian uh, is, is going to draw on his experience with the, with the wealth of experience that he and his firm have in, in um, working at the College of Physicians. And I'm going to ask Julian to talk to you for a bit on the changing climate, the changing environment in, uh, in the college, starting with the perspective of how the complainant may be treated today compared to how that may have occurred in the past, the support mechanisms, mm -hmm. so that um, if you're representing the, the um, professional under attack, you might understand how that climate has changed and is changing. Julian, do you want to uh, start with that? Yes, if you were uh, now to act as a lawyer and go up in front of the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario, things might be quite different. You might first, as uh, if you do get retained for such, and for some reason the medical perfect, uh, protective society is not representing the doctor, you might very well phone up the counsel to the discipline committee, which happens to be somebody from Faskin and Calvin, and ask them for all the rules and what uh, are Faskin Godfrey, whatever it's called, uh, and ask them for the rules of how it's done, because now when you uh, arrive, you'll see that there is a lawyer for the discipline committee. So you will argue, the de, uh, as defense counsel, the prosecutor will argue, and then the lawyer for the discipline committee will opine as to her or his view of what the law is, and then the discipline committee will decide it. Under the upcoming Regulated Health Professions Act, which will most probably be implemented 
at the end of this year, which will cover 18 of the health professions, 47% of each board will be lay people appointed by Queen's Park. You will have, most probably next year, a number of discipline committees which will have a majority of lay people, and such will be the end of curial deference, if there is any, because my view of curial deference with the Divisional Court or the Court of Appeal in Ontario, if they agree with the discipline committee's decision, they exhibit curial deference. They don't agree with it, then they reverse the penalty and never mention or think about curial deference. Uh, just on Monday, uh, the uh, provincial government has appointed four new lay appointments to the College of Physicians and Surgeons, and now out of the six lay appointments, five are women. In the beginning of 1994, they will go to 15 lay appointments, and my guess is 12 or 13 of those lay appointments appointed by Queen's Park will be women, so you'll have quite a change. The change, the difficult part for a prosecutor of prosecuting a sexual offense against a professional is that the is that the complainant is a person suffering from great trauma. In my experience, if a complainant comes forth before the College of Physicians and Surgeons to complain about sex, uh, my basic bias is that they're telling the truth. That for them to come forward and to make this grave allegation against a, a sort of figure of authority is very difficult for them. So you have a different kind of hearing where there are now support people provided for the complainant, which may always be an area for cross-examination, but a complainant has a great deal of difficulty complaining to a large impersonal institution. And so the college is careful to have the complainant interviewed by appropriate and sympathetic people, and so there's now as utterly opposed to the old Crown Attorney approach, because they had lots of cases, the, the complainant was just like anybody else, put them in the witness box. Now the complainant and the prosecutor, uh, per necessity, become much closer than, when, than would ordinarily exist in a regular day-to-day -day piece of litigation. So those are some of the changes you'd see. And um, one of the things that you may find is that the, the and I'm not sure I want to call it pioneering work, but certainly the work done by the college of physicians and surgeons is going to have an impact uh, on other uh, health care professions as the college model is being, as Julian has just commented on, um, becomes much more um, uh, prevalent. The problem, of course, is that the, the college has been able to develop all of this expertise and these fine processes because uh, everybody is getting paid there by somebody else. That is, the, generally speaking, the doctors who are there are, are being supported by uh, the non-existent insurance company that insures them. And we'll come back to that in, in just a second. Um, Elizabeth uh, Stewart uh, is going to talk to us for a, a few seconds about something called the McFedrin Report, uh, which is working to change attitudes and to alter uh, expectations of what will happen in the disciplinary process. All right, well, just uh, to tell you a little bit about myself, um, I'm uh, involved in defense work for physicians before the Discipline Committee of the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario. I also do prosecutions for the Ontario Board of Examiners in Psychology, which is the governing body of psychologists registered to practice uh, in the province of Ontario. So I uh, hope that I'm able to bring a, a certain degree of uh, objectivity, if that's not too uh, putting it too highly, 
uh, to the issues raised uh, by the McFedrin report, uh, by the task force's report, and by some of the developments which have taken place since that time. Uh, my comments, I think, probably by necessity, are going to be very superficial and general because this is uh, 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 an area which is still evolving and we've seen some developments take place. Obviously, there are going to be more changes that are going to take place uh, because of the increased uh, attention which has been focused on, on this issue. The title of our, our panel sec uh, session is uh, Immoral Allegations of Immoral Behavior. I suppose the, um, the glib uh, reaction to that would, uh, would be uh, immoral behavior for doctors is sex, uh, immoral behavior for lawyers is money. Uh, the two are occasionally do overlap, uh, and it'll be interesting to see, especially with respect to the legal profession, how things unfold in the future. But for the present, a lot of the attention of the, of the College of Physicians and Surgeons has been placed upon dealing with uh, all of the allegations of sexual impropriety against its members, which have, uh, which have uh, in, in part, at least, been generated as a result of the publicity given to Mary Lou McFedrin's task force report. Um, some of the doctors that I deal with, uh, including many who are not in any trouble at all, but with whom I'm dealing as experts on cases, have, uh, have made the comment that they do feel under attack. They do feel uh, unfairly uh, scrutinized and perhaps victimized as a result of the, of the fallout from um, the McFedrin report, the uh, publicity given to the notion that 10% of the physicians practicing uh, are uh, considered to have uh, engaged in some form or other of sexual impropriety with patients uh, is a statistic with which they take great issue. And uh, uh, certainly there are many aspects of controversy yet unresolved that arise out of that report. One thing, though, that has happened, and we see uh, it in our own dealings at the college, is that more um, attention is being given to assisting the complainant through the discipline process. And I suppose from the perspective of a defense lawyer, uh, it's important to ensure that the uh, professional who is accused receives at least a corresponding degree of, of support and assistance, whether uh, the allegations or, are proven or, or not. Uh, because uh, it's obviously a, a very stressful and difficult time for that individual uh, uh, to uh, be involved in. One of the difficulties, too, that uh, arises from the McFedrin report is the inevitable uh, pooling of all sorts of behavior into a uh, category or under a category of sexual impropriety. <clears throat> and this is one of the things that is disturbing uh, to professionals uh, to see uh, relatively um, insignificant remarks or comments made to patients uh, dealt with through the discipline process and uh, dealt with in the same way as, uh, as for instance, predatory conduct toward a psychiatric patient uh, would be dealt with in, uh, in a disciplinary context. This is a matter of, of some, uh, some concern, to, uh, and rightly so, to members of the profession. I'm probably exaggerating it to some extent, but unfortunately, um, the, the publicity that has surrounded the report and the, the attention that is, it has received uh, from the public and from the college has made uh, many members of the profession feel as though if they are ever charged with, uh, with that kind of conduct that they will be guilty until proven innocent. And uh, uh, this, uh, I just raised this uh, for you to think about, uh, may have uh, a damaging effect on the way in which uh, doctors practice medicine.
certainly the college has made it very clear that uh, it uh, considers it prudent for any physician conducting a, an internal examination or a pelvic examination upon a female patient to have a third person present in the room in order presumably to be a witness uh, for the defense uh, if any allegation of impropriety is made. So, you know, that has to be a classic example of practicing medicine defensively, uh, which has uh, per potentially negative implications for the cost of delivery of, uh, of health services as well as uh, uh, potentially intrusive and damaging effects on the uh, on the uh, uh, trust relationship between the physician and the patient uh, in a larger context. Just uh, one thing I did want to say as well uh, with, uh, with respect to the changes that we've seen take place before the discipline committee at the college is that there has been a, a renewed focus on the uh, importance of the role of the prosecutor. Uh, and in, in my view, uh, the uh, uh, great stress has been placed over the last while in the, uh, up upon the obligation of the prosecutor to provide disclosure to the defense to be scrupulously fair. I'm not saying that that is adhered to in all circumstances, and no doubt there have been appeals and will be appeals in which the prosecutor uh, prosecutor's conduct will be uh, uh, an issue, but uh, uh, one thing that uh, that has uh, developed uh, as far as the prosecutor's role is concerned is a heightened awareness of the, of the need for that individual to uh, to maintain an, an even hand and uh, and a balanced approach to the prosecution. This uh, may be influenced to some extent in the future by what may may be uh, uh, a, a growing role for the complainant in the process. Uh, already, and on a couple of occasions, complainants have been represented by counsel in discipline proceedings to make submissions on a limited basis as determined appropriate by the uh, discipline panel. Um, but uh, certainly, it's one of the recommendations of the McFedrin report, which I don't believe is picked up in, in the legislation, but I think we'll have uh, an inevitable impact on the extent to which the panels are prepared to exercise discretion in favor of the complainant's counsel. Uh, we're, we'll probably see more and more circumstances in which lawyers representing complainants are participating, at least to some extent, in the proceedings themselves. Just to, just to show you this precise example, in uh, a public case, now most discipline cases uh, before the doctors are in public. In sexual cases, they close uh, most, if not all. But uh, one of the cases recently, the complainant wanted to be open. Uh, somebody, uh, the defense, wished to have some psychiatric records. The complainant objected, and so she was entitled to have her own lawyer argue as to the psychiatric records. Later on, uh, a witness came forward after the case was closed with some other uh, testimony as to things that the complainant had said during the hearing, which touched on uh, the evidence at the hearing. Uh, the panel allowed her to have her own lawyer to argue as to whether this new evidence should be allowed, to cross-examine, and then to make a submission to the panel as to whether that evidence had any significance in their final decision. So that uh, there will be power in the new regulated Health Professions Act for all those health tribunals to allow a complainant in its discretion to have a lawyer for certain functions if it sees fit. Thank you, Julian. Uh, I, the point I think that's coming from all of this is that we, what, while we're talking in the first instance about the medical profession, in fact, um, when you start to look at it, we're going to be dealing with pharmacists 
and with chiropractors and with psychologists and with psychiatrists. Um, well, psychiatrists would be covered in the medical profession, but the whole range of the healing professions that are covered under the Health Disciplines Act. One of the um, little incidents that happened in the last year that has not been given a lot of attention is the uh, proclaiming into force of the Class Proceedings Act. And um, I found that sort of interesting because um, I, I encountered someone who had uh, been part of the class proceeding for the brainwashing experiments in Montreal and was uh, in to see me to sign the release for that as, uh, as, a, um, as a member of the class that had been abused by the psychiatric team uh, under contract to the CIA. Um, right at the moment, those of us who might be inclined to sue doctors um, still don't have the right to do that under under contingent fee basis. But if um, a, um, a person running a, a, a psychological clinic had abused a group of his or her uh, patients, it might very well be that there is now an opportunity to have that group of patients uh, to get working together under a class proceeding with the lawyer on a contingent fee basis. Uh, Patricia Jackson um, was not going to talk at length about that, but is going to mention it in passing and has a couple of comments about uh, the impact uh, on, on uh, these proceedings where the allegations are essentially behavioral and uh, how that relates to uh, that. Uh, issue might relate to the issue of insurance, and I'll try and get her to include a little bit about class proceedings as she's going by. Well, and I'll, and I'll try to do that. Um, in addition to the immoral conduct uh, of the sort that you've heard described so far, there have been some developments um, in North America generally, and in Canada in particular, over the last year or two that I think have escaped attention amongst professionals generally, which have significant ramifications for all of us, uh, perhaps less doctors, but certainly accountants and lawyers and so on. Uh, and I'm speaking here less of the disciplinary proceeding, although they may reflect some of the same social dynamics that are taking place in disciplinary proceedings. And I'm speaking really more about actions and potential actions against professionals for an apparent involvement uh, or tainting in apparently immoral activities of their clients. Um, to give this a little focus for you, uh, let me tell you the story that gave it focus for me, which is that of a $40 million action against Davis and Company in British Columbia right now. Um, and it's on the basis of, of, a, of a cause of action that has its origins in the 19th century that I wanted to just briefly talk to you about. But, the high points are that Davis and Company is being sued not only by its clients in relation to its transaction, the clients were a credit union, but all the depositors in the credit union. Because about $40 million of uh, money for that credit union was invested in, uh, in investments that weren't authorized under the statute. The lawyer at Davis and Company, who was advising the uh, directors, was said simply not to have turned his mind to this and not to have checked, as he should have, the statute that kind of sets it all out. And that the, the idea that that might generate a claim in negligence is, is not probably surprising to us. I, I don't know the, I mean, I, I, of course, I'm not saying these facts are true, but those are the allegations. And if that led to a claim in negligence, we'd say, well, that, that's not very surprising. What is startling and alarming is that it has also led to a claim um, by the beneficiaries, by the depositors, who were not the clients, uh, on the basis that this lawyer knowingly facilitated or assisted in a breach of fiduciary obligation, that language that lurks back there from the 19th century. And equally disturbing, from, from the point of view of the professional, is the position of the errors and emissions coverage insurer, that this isn't covered because they have the standard kind of language that we all have here too in, La Los, uh, in Ontario that says um, dishonest, uh, malicious, fraudulent acts aren't covered. And the allegation in BC is by, by assisting this breach of trust, the lawyer is in effect engaged constructively or otherwise in some sort of dishonest endeavor. Now that, this case is a long way from being decided, but it uh, certainly causes one to sit up and take notice and say, what, what's this all about? 
and how could we avoid, uh, if we're thinking of ourselves or the clients we represent, being the ob object of that kind of action? Or alternatively, if you're looking at it from the point of view of investors or beneficiaries or depositors or groups of people in one of the many enterprises that have gone under in the last few years, is there a cause of action against the professional deep pocket, which is largely what, of course, much of this is about? Um, I think it probably has a lot of its origin in the United States, where as the savings and loan companies went down, you get comments by the courts along the lines of, um, where were the professionals when the properly, so-called properly structured transactions that created this morass were being, were taking place? What is difficult to understand is that with all the professional talent involved, both accounting and legal, why at least one professional would not have blown the whistle to stop the overreaching that took place? And when in the case of one of those savings and loan companies, the regulator later in the states did what the regulator in the states, in contrast to in Canada, had the authority to do, and go after the lawyers for having facilitated the transaction and for not having blown the whistle on their own clients, which is a sort of startling notion for Canadian lawyers. Um, the result and the $40 million payment that was made leads to the heading, they got what they deserved. And there is, I think, a, a large sort of sense of feeling in society at large that highly paid professionals have a duty to their clients. But at least in some circumstances, those things that feel a bit immoral in some kind of way or dishonest, they owe a larger duty. Uh, in Canada, it may not yet be the duty to blow the whistle, but it probably is at least the duty to tell your client how to behave properly and, uh, and probably as well, and certainly as well to, if they won't, get off the, get off the brief. Just briefly, because um, this development in the law is the subject of innumerable articles and as yet as it concerns professionals in Canada, at least. I don't, I, I didn't find any decisions that are particularly helpful in telling you where it's going, where it might stop, and what it'll do. Um, and, and a list of those articles, with any luck, will be, is available at the table on the way out. But, but, the, but the two kinds of actions that, um, that lead to this problem are knowing receipt of trust property and knowing assistance in the breach of a fiduciary obligation or breach of trust. The difficulty is that although the cause of action is called knowing, it doesn't mean necessarily knowing. It means knowing or probably should have known or knowing and maybe reckless about the consequences, um, of being reckless about the consequences or being careless in certain circumstances about making inquiries about what your client is doing that should have put you on notice. It's. Um, it, it's, it's unclear in the cases what you have to know. Some of them suggest there has to be something that would tell you that your client is behaving dishonestly. Some of them say you have to appear as though you're behaving dishonestly. And I say when I say you, I'm analogizing to other cases because as I say, the professionals haven't specifically been in the spotlight on these cases as yet in the reported decisions. Some of them suggest that it's enough that you have a sense of an improper purpose or that you have enough facts in your possession to suggest that you should have known that there was an improper purpose. Um, and it's, it's those kinds of cases, those kinds of issues, and the extent of the knowledge and the, and the question of, of the conduct being wrong in some ways that throw up the, the additional issue of whether if you get stuck in one of these situations, you will or will not have insurance coverage, because you may not. Um, as to what level of assistance you have to, as a professional, provide in order to get stuck, that too is an open question. But the, the, the articles suggest, and the case law suggests, it can be anywhere from inducing a breach of the fiduciary obligation, which one hopes is not the situation that many professionals would find themselves in. But it can include facilitating by advising, or arguably failing to advise, as in the Davis case, or simply benefiting. From a, from a breach of fiduciary obligation that you ought to have realized was going on. And when you get your fees at the end of the day, it's at least arguable that you've benefited. So the, the scale, potential scale of the liability is, is frightening indeed for professionals. The absence of the, the insurance safety net is certainly uh, scary. And I think 
suggests to me, suggested to me as I delved into this area that we should all of us know a little bit more about what the signposts are for this emerging cause of action or this developing cause of action and take a few um, protective measures, at least on our own behalf and on behalf of the professionals we advise. I guess the flip side of this is, as you, if you're looking at this from the perspective of investors who, uh, in, in enterprises that have failed and have no money, um, or beneficiaries of a trust that has gone or muck and has no money, um, that you should, you should consider the flip side of these questions. But it seems to me um, you should begin by asking yourself in any situation, whether when you're advising someone, is there any potential here for a fiduciary obligation? And there's, the answer to that question has got to be, whatever this, the answer is today, there's a lot more likely a lot more likely that there's a scope here for fiduciary obligation than there was 10 years ago because they seem to be permeating our society at a rapid rate. If there is, have, has the advisor, if it's you or the person you're advising, discharged the obligation to alert that fiduciary to the fiduciary obligations? Or on the flip side, did the advisor fail to do that? Um, are there facts which indicate that either that a fiduciary obligation is about to be breached or that it's probably going to be breached. Because if there are, you probably should be put on your inquiry. You should probably giving, be giving the client the right advice about what not to do. And if the client won't take the advice, you should be taking immediate steps to dissociate yourself from the client's activities. As I say, I don't think the, yet, the, the stage is yet at the point in, in <coughs> Canada where you, are, you have an obligation to blow the whistle on your client. I would say, as a matter of fact, that solicitor client privilege means you can't. But there has been recent, the recent moves a couple of years ago at the OSC to try and turn lawyers into the policemen of their cl client's activities. And I would say that unless we do a fairly good job of policing ourselves and our clients with the correct and vigilant advice, we shouldn't preclude the likelihood or the possibility that down the road, Regulators will be seeking greater authority to make lo turn lawyers into policemen of their own clients' activities. And just so I can be true to the instruction that I was given at the outset, when you take that, this, this sort of novel cause of action in search of the, the deep professional pockets and couple it with the likelihood that it will in many instances be asserted by groups of beneficiaries and uh, investors and depositors who may now use the extremely simplified well, easier mechanism for suit of the class action, the possible funding from the class action funding mechanism, and the, the ability to, to, to run this all, whole th enterprise on a contingent fee exercise. Um, as professionals or as people advising professionals, it is another area, I think, when we're look, where we're looking at a rather brand new world and one that we should be very cautious about. Uh, I want to just, if I can, then pick up the, the word fiduciary relationship for a minute and now come back over to Julian. Um, that word seems to be getting some play in the field of professional conduct. There's, uh, in the paper I prepare, I just wish to emphasize in that paper the important new themes that I see. Uh, the first is the expanding role of the expert witness in cases. But the second is that the Supreme Court of Canada uh, is certainly in the Norberg and Weinberg case. Uh, Madam Justice McLaughlin and, and one other aggressively stated that the relationship between a doctor and a patient was a fiduciary one. They set out some citations for it, and it's been picked up in the divisional court. And of course, in certain instances, it's very clear that it must be. But if it, uh, that will represent a big change in the long run if automatically courts come to the conclusion that the relationship is fiduciary the penalties will be much greater. So it's something to watch. And some, uh, they've all, all the judges have said in some circumstances, uh, a relationship between a lawyer and a client or a patient and a doctor could be partially contract, so there would be remedies and breach of contract. 
partially remedies in, uh, in negligence, but certainly McLaughlin was very clear that in most cases, I think it's fair to paraphrase her, she would find doctor-patient a fiduciary relationship. As a result in that case, which uh, she doubled the damages. So it'll be a big change. And so Trisha's right, uh, 10 years ago, I don't believe the courts would have been uh, as willing to find as many relationships fiduciary as they do today. If I can just pick up on that too, in the uh, prosecutions uh, against health professionals for allegations of sexual impropriety, the approach has been to characterize the uh, relationship as one of trust and the conduct complained of as being a breach of trust. And uh, <coughs> that uh, has certainly had an impact on the gravity uh, with which the conduct is, uh, is viewed and, uh, and perhaps has, uh, has influenced the, uh, the penalties that have been attached to it. Uh, it's no longer likely that um, such conduct could be uh, excused or or argued to be uh, a, a, a sort of an expression of immaturity or uh, or a uh, uh, aber aberrant behavior on an isolated occasion. The the most successful prosecutions that that I've seen have tended to be directed toward emphasizing that breach of trust aspect and also emphasizing the. Uh, uh, counter therapeutic uh, effect that such uh, action may have for the uh, the patient or the client involved. <coughs> I did want to say too, though, I couldn't let <coughs> Julian's point of a few minutes go by when he mentioned that just because somebody makes the complaint, he has a tendency to assume that they are telling the truth. Um, that may be so in certain cases. There's, there have been many cases that have been dealt with before uh, the discipline committee of the college, and I'm sure the discipline panels of, of <coughs> other committees which have, have demonstrated the contrary, that the individual involved for a variety of reasons may either be deliberately fabricating the allegation or uh, may genuinely believe a set of facts to be true, which are then demonstrated to the satisfaction of the committee not to be so. Uh, certainly the uh, uh, situation still remains, I would hope, before any discipline panel that the, uh, uh, the onus is on the prosecution and the mere fact that a complaint has been made is not proof of its validity. I didn't suggest otherwise, <coughs> just so I get it on the record. I didn't suggest otherwise. It's, a, it's always it's great when it, you get the prosecutor and the defense sitting side by well, side I'm, talking about the same but, issue. It's wonderful. Uh, but I just was talking about uh, a general, what I foresee is change of approach by a whole staff that there is, um, there's no longer a sort of attitude, oh, it can't be true. And that's, uh, I'm not saying that that used to be so, but just generally, more and more, with complaints of sexual abuse, people are really listening. And they're not uh, insisting in the investigative process of denying or putting through, through uh, people uh, enor through enormous stress. I quite agree that many cases fail and the discipline committee in my opinion has been well served by fair prosecutors excellent defense and uh, now the discipline committees are very used to listening to law and the advantage of the discipline committees having their own lawyers who can now assist them because of the con case in the drafting of <coughs> reasons which is a huge change before the con case, for a little while, lawyers could not, lawyers to the discipline committee could not assist 
the discipline committee in the drafting of its reasons. And any finding of such was enough to set aside those reasons. The Kahn case, which I've given you, another important part of it was the Court of Appeal said that uh, after the discipline committee had retired, and if it had come to a conclusion, then the discipline committee lawyer could assist in drafting the reasons. And could, I think as was put, uh, could assist sufficiently to help reasons survive an appeal once the discipline committee had made up its own mind, uninfluenced <laughs> by their counsel. That's a big difference. This uh, concept of uh, expanding and clarifying the role of the relationship, the professional client-patient relationship as being fiduciary, um, seems to be clear. And the question that I put to the panel is, is that having an impact on what kind of tactics are now going to work in professional uh, proceedings? For example, um, does it have an impact on the kind of cross-examination that is effective, on the way in which counsel behave, on the kind of case that can be met, on how aggressive you can be, how aggressive you should be? Julian, should we start with you? Well, let's, uh, well, let, let the okay. defense yeah. take a run at that. Yeah, no, that's a, a very good question. I was just thinking that in light of all of the developments, um, that have taken place over the last couple of years, a defense lawyer had better have a lot more in his or her arsenal than the good character of the uh, professional uh, to uh, point to. Um, it, it's no longer a simple matter of one person's word against the others in the expectation that the professional's version of events will prevail. I'm not saying that that was historically the case um, because uh, the college, for instance, has always taken a very dim view of, uh, of sexual impropriety uh, uh, allegations uh, as proven before its discipline committee. But now with the advent of certain kinds of expert uh, testimony, expert evidence, explanations from psychiatrists as to why, for instance, an individual may take 10 years before making an allegation, those are uh, the sorts of, uh, uh, th th that is the kind of evidence that, uh, that is going to have to be met at the, um, at the discipline committee level. And I suppose the job starts the minute uh, the client comes through the door. Uh, you can't automatically assume that in a credibility battle, the physician uh, is going to be believed. You have to spend a great deal of time with the individual in order to determine how the problem might best be approached in order to arrive at the most positive solution. In some cases, it becomes evident uh, early that uh, there is uh, substance to the allegations, in which case you have to devote your attention and efforts to trying to deal with uh, the individual and, and come up with some uh, rehabilitation approach, some sort of uh, defense approach that may be far more directed toward uh, putting in evidence of all factors by way of mitigation and all steps that have been taken toward rehabilitation in order to uh, achieve the best possible result. In other cases, in which your client is uh, credibly maintaining a position of innocence, then you better have some evidence that would at least create a, 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 a reasonable argument uh, and uh, uh, attack on the complainant's credibility. Uh, because uh, you, you're going to have to be able to uh, provide some sort of information and evidence to the uh, discipline committee to uh, explain why this complainant is going through this hideous process. Either she is lying and has a reason for doing so, or she believes that these things 
have occurred and is because of a psychiatric condition or, or other reasons uh, mistaken and wrong. But you're going to have to have that kind of evidence. It can't simply be uh, one person's uh, word against another's anymore, in my view. Finally, uh, before we turn to questions, uh, we heard some uh, heard an interesting statistic this morning from um, Paul Farley with regard to uh, how ridiculous it is to hire a lawyer if you're a defendant in proceedings in front of the Institute of Chartered Accountants because they nail everybody. Um, Joe, I don't think poor Paul said that. That's about what he said, isn't it, Paul? No, that's not quite. Everybody but what? Um, what's the? Do you have a do you have a chance of successfully defending people in front of the colleges? Oh sure, a very good chance. And if you look at their annual reports, there are a great number of reports that don't have any name in them. The rule is that if the person hasn't been convicted, the name in the report is not revealed. And, uh, and of course, there are many standards cases. There are many cases over failing to give reports or overcharging or uh, being rude or all kinds of standards, failing to meet the standards in delivery of medical services. And uh, then, of course, there are the range of sexual abuse, but uh, uh, there's a very high percentage of acquittals. I don't know what the percentage is, but there are a lot. Well, Julian, if you had to put your finger on the key component of successfully defending a professional in, a, in that kind of process, what would, you, what would you say came first? I'm, it's, I'm sure it's not simple, or, but what's the one lesson that you leave at the end of a day like today? Well, I saw um, John Laskin and I had a case a very complicated case. And Laskin uh, cross-examined an expert witness who was utterly brilliant. And what Laskin does is what Gretzky did for a little bit last night. He slows down the pace of the game to his pace. And I think if you always talk quietly, and always speak in conversational tones. The rewards are immense because discipline committees are embarrassed with hostilities. They are embarrassed with the thrust and jousting which we enjoy when your adrenaline gets up. Why not? Stick it to them. You got them. Yeah! Bang! It doesn't happen often, but when it happens, it's very hard not to get the eel in the bucket. Uh, so you slow the pace. Often in the old days, it's been told to me that Roy McMurtry used to appear before convocation to try and argue against the sentence of some lawyer, and Roy would get up, and of course, Roy is absolutely inarticulate and mucking around and shifting his feet, and you know, but he never got angry, never got too aggressive, never stretched the committee, and then inevitably, Roy's fellow seemed to walk away. So try and keep the pace to your pace. And don't overstretch what you're trying to sell. Work out precisely what you're trying to sell. Take a minute to write that down. <laughs> Elizabeth? <clears throat> well, I suppose I'm going to be saying something that I'm sure somebody this morning must have said, uh, and that is, uh, to indicate the importance of developing your strategy and considering the strength of your position well before you ever walk into that discipline committee hearing. It may well be that your successful defense is a guilty plea with a ton of evidence that helps your person get the best possible result. 
if you can save that person's ticket, you've you may, depending on the circumstances of the case, done a superior job for that person. And if you've got a defense on the facts, if the, there is a, a real credibility issue before any administrative tribunal, I would expect, and particularly one made up largely of, of members of the profession deal to, that your client is a part of, uh, you, your client is better served by taking an approach that is vigorous in that individual's defense, but low key enough so as not to um, destroy that person's credibility along with your own. I agree with Julian, the, the, those sorts of committees don't like pyrotechnics. You can certainly conduct a very effective cross-examination similar in many respects to what would be appropriate in a courtroom, um, but you have to remember that the committee will not enjoy seeing a complainant unfairly uh, raked over the coals. If that person is considered by you and your client to be lying, you're going to have to cross-examine that person and you're going to have to cross-examine that person closely, but you will try to do it in such a way that doesn't offend the sensibilities of the panel. And most certainly when you're cross-examining other members of that profession who are giving expert testimony, again, you will want to be very careful to do it in such a way so as not to create any unpleasantness in the proceedings uh, you will have to uh, try to walk the fine line and destroy that individual's opinion uh, while saving everyone's face in the process. That's not easy to do. Patricia, do you want to wrap that up? I probably can't do that. I guess uh, my, my sense of the, th the thing that is m most important in terms of um, defending professionals civilly or in discipline proceedings is that particularly given the climate of the last few years and as we see it today, whatever that defense is, it has to take account of the fact that you are defending a professional and that the professional has to live up to the standards that society is now imposing on professionals. And therefore, the kind of defense that uh, I, I actually chair a discipline pro uh, tribunal at the University of Toronto, and I've seen defenses there that proceed on the basis that um, the accused, so-called, by, by his lawyer, and it was, uh, the accused is the subject of a criminal charge, and therefore it's a criminal burden of proof, and um, uh, he's entitled to the benefit of every doubt, and there's not, uh, no reference to the fact that he or she is a professional, he or she that has to set, has to meet some of, has to meet those professional standards. The theory of the defense and the conduct of the defense, civilly or in discipline proceedings, I think has to recognize those standards, has to say either they were met or here's why they weren't met, or here's why the standard is slightly different than you're articulating. Your client in those circumstances is not a criminal accused and won't be treated like a criminal accused, and, and, and therefore those standards do have to be articulated, recognized, and dealt with and met. Both in both in substance, in terms of your theory of the defense, and how you choose to present it, which is, I guess, harkening back to what Julian said. The big wild card in any discipline committee is the panel, because you spend all your time with a careful cross examination. You've learned all the rules about cross examination. You don't ask a why question. You don't ask. You don't give them a chance. Isn't it true on the 17th of August, between 10 and 11 in the morning, you didn't see my client? <laughs> the panel, well, did any other time, <laughs> any other time that year, did you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so again and again, the best laid questions, because you lead, there's cross-examination, there may be a little rebuttal, then, then the panel starts to ask questions. You are given the tiny spade at the end. The chairman says, well, do you have any questions arising out of the questions from the panel? <laughs> so, and 
after 10 or 12 discipline committees, the panel members are very shrewd, and some of them like to cross-examine. So it's just, and there's nothing you can do but you hold on to the chair and smile. <laughs> Well, have we answered all your questions, or have you? Yes, Leon. In view of the enormous credibility problems, have we got to the stage where perhaps an answer may be, or if it's a thought, to use polygraph evidence for a defendant who maintains that uh, he's not in any way guilty of the, the, the uh, facts that are being alleged? I recently was a lawyer for a committee who heard a witness who had polygraph evidence to prove that she'd lied, and I can tell you it didn't go over very well. <laughs> 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 well, I'm thinking about the positive sense, that with having, having the professionals, uh, if, if the person passed the test, then I suppose you could file that, and I suppose it could be, you could argue against that, because I, as I see, we're getting opinion evidence now from psychologists and all the other types of people who say that the complainant or complainants may be telling the truth. But if not follow it, you will get that kind of evidence to demonstrate that the extent of the cues or whatever we call them this week may be telling the truth. All right, is Michelle? Yeah, she's the speak after. Are you, are you going to talk about that? She can't. She knows uh, all about Polly. I can. Okay. All right, well, well, Leon, we'll defer to the next panel. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Doug, unless somebody here wants to take a run at, at, at calling I'll, a polygraph operator. I'll just operator. make the one, I mean, I, I had in the course of the Shelley Martell inquiry to find out about polygraphs, which I'd never had an occasion to do before. And I'm told that, that, that it's quite standard in these things, that they ask a series of sort of test questions to monitor the polygraph. And one of the test questions is, have you ever lied before? And it is assumed that any honest answer to that question by anybody in the world would be yes. And so there's a, sort of, there's a series of sort of double bind questions leading into the polygraph. And anybody who wanted to introduce the polygraph evidence would have to go through all those double bind questions, at the end of which, without an explanation from the polygraph expert that, that, that sort of twists you in knots, you, by the time you get through the 10 questions, you're, you're pretty confident that the person was lying in any event. So I think there's a kind of two-edged sword as a practical matter to a polygraph test. I think I can answer the question. I argue that really on the case of the Supreme Court of Canada, which dealt with the polygraph, they think it was a pleading case. It may not be anymore. And you can get the polygraph evidence at the back door. You can have your client sign a form and say, I'm examined by a psychiatrist or a psychologist. And then the back door is open to the client to say, I'm not examined by a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist can give the results of the polygraph test, the sodium amyltal test, the ink loss test, and all the other tests on Leon. So we can get it in that way, the back door. That's if you want to look at filling up the Supreme Court of Canada. There's a, there's a, uh, I, I would think if I were sitting on a disciplinary panel, though, I would have, uh, I would find it sort of interesting because um, a lot of that depends on the relationship between the lawyer who hires the polygraph operator and the way in which the screening is done up to that point. Any other questions before we wrap this panel up? Okay, fine, thank you very much. Um, there's your panel. Okay. I'm out in her resume, and I won't read them for you at this time. Um, all, all of us who have had to deal with professionals under attack, uh, where there are elements of the charge that also breach some form of a criminal legislation, have had concerns about how we conduct ourselves during the process of the of the disciplinary as part of the disciplinary process and its impact on the criminal liability of the, of the professional that's under attack. And um, Michelle is going to take a little time to tell us about some of the guidelines on that and to help us through that aspect of the problem. Thank you, Michelle. Since the, the topic of polygraphs had come up, I should say that the Supreme Court of Canada has held in the criminal context that polygraph test results are not admissible. Uh, whether or not there's some scope to argue in light of decisions like uh, Kahn that perhaps that should be looked at again, I think is, is debatable. But um, the reason that they've been held not to be admissible is that they are said to fall into the category of oath helping. Um, so I um, have seen it used in the criminal context only as a form of uh, background investigative technique that the police sometimes resort to 
when an accused is asked to come by the police station uh, and then is asked whether or not he or she would be prepared to take a polygraph test to substantiate his or her denial of the charge. Uh, and there's a professor at the University of Toronto in the psychology department named John Furity who has done a lot of very good work uh, on how police officers use polygraph tests as a confession-inducing device because of the way in which the tests are structured. The tests are administered, the accused is uh, generally told that he or she has failed, and the officers at that point attempt to extract a confession. So that's the only context in the criminal side uh, that I'm aware of, uh, of polygraph tests being used these days. In terms of parallel criminal and disciplinary proceedings, the initial question, I suppose, is do you have any way, if you're dealing with a professional and you think that criminal charges may be coming, is there any way that you can prevent those proceedings from taking place? And I think the easy answer to that is no. Uh, prior to the Charter, courts had held that there was no bar to uh, parallel or concurrent discipline and criminal proceedings. And that position has become even more entrenched since the Charter with the Supreme Court of Canada's decision in the Wigglesworth case, which you're probably all aware of. Uh, and in essence, the court there held that there was no reason uh, for there to be a bar on these kinds of parallel proceedings because they are viewed as addressing two separate issues. In one proceeding, the professional is being called to account to his or her professional body. In the other, he or she is being asked to account to society at large for whatever the transgression alleged or alleged transgression may be. So the court found that there was no difficulty uh, in saying that the professional should be accountable in two separate arenas. Now, at one time, of course, the most common case of overlap between the two proceedings were those uh, body of cases involving misappropriation of funds, be it theft or fraud or breach of trust. Uh, and certainly in the law society context, it uh, was not uncommon to see parallel proceedings. And even in terms of health professionals, it was not uh, all that uncommon to see parallel proceedings involving things like OHIP frauds. Recently, of course, there's been uh, an explosion of cases where the alleged misconduct is sexual in nature. And really what this raises is the interesting situation where, in fact, there may be three avenues of pursuit against the professional. You may have the disciplinary proceeding, the criminal charge, and then the civil action, which I, I think Ms. Vella may spend some time on later today, uh, arising out of the alleged misconduct for damages. So what I'm going to suggest to you that as a result, concerns about tactics and strategy become very important when you're acting for a professional whose conduct involves something that has at least a, a criminal overtone to it. And it's particularly important to know what protections might be available to your client in the criminal context. Uh, because, for example, I can tell you that these days in the criminal courts, uh, a jail term for a sexual transgression uh, is pretty much the norm. So that not only is your client looking at possible revocation of his or her license to practice, but if the offense involves sexual misconduct, the professional is likely also looking at the potential for a period in custody. So as a result, what I think you have to look very carefully at are, first of all, considerations which have to do with whether or not there's an advantage in you pressing for one of those proceedings to go ahead before the other. Um, should you, for example, argue that you'd like to see the criminal trial take place so your client can be exonerated in that forum and then have to worry about the professional discipline proceeding. You may know uh, that statutes like the Health Disciplines Act specify that a criminal conviction in many circumstances can in and of itself constitute professional misconduct. And obviously in those kinds of situations, uh, the fact of a conviction in criminal court really predetermines the finding in the discipline context. Uh, and as somebody who prosecutes cases before the College of Physicians, I can tell you that our job is made a lot easier if, in fact, there's been a finding of guilt uh, in criminal court. Then all we have to do is charge professional misconduct under this particular section of the Health Disciplines Act, file the, uh, the proper documents to evidence the conviction, and it's really a foregone conclusion as to what will happen at the discipline hearing. 
Even if there's no specific provision in the statute, the Ontario Court of Appeal has held in a case called Delcor, Delcore, that conviction of a criminal offence is prima facie proof of the underlying conduct for the purpose of a later discipline proceeding. So even if you don't have it being expressly stated in the statute, Delcore would seem to give the professional body's prosecution team a leg up in trying to establish that your client is guilty of professional misconduct. All of this would tend to suggest that you are probably better off having the discipline proceeding go before any criminal trial. Because as well, uh, the Divisional Court in Ontario has recently held in the Gillen case that even if the criminal trial goes first and precedes the discipline hearing and the professional is acquitted, it doesn't matter. That doesn't prohibit the professional body from proceeding to hold the discipline hearing. And indeed, it doesn't proceed the uh, discipline committee of that body from finding that the professional is guilty of misconduct. So the upshot of all of that is that a favorable result in criminal court isn't going to help you very much in the context of the discipline proceedings. On the other hand, an unfavorable result in criminal court uh, can very badly damage your case before the professional body. Now, having said that, then, what uh, aspects of criminal uh, trials or criminal proceedings should you have an eye on as you get ready for the discipline hearing? Perhaps the most important development has been the Supreme Court of Canada's decision in Stinchcomb, uh, and you no doubt uh, have already heard about it today, and most of you have probably relied upon it at some point, but if you haven't, it's a very significant decision which I would suggest you take a look at. Because what it does is it provides very broad access to the defense, to all relevant information which has been gathered in the course of a criminal investigation. And that includes not only information that hurts the professional, but also information which may indeed support the professional's defense. So that while it's true that prosecutorial teams for many of the professional bodies, like the College of Physicians, apply the spirit of Stinchcomb, nonetheless it is arguable that Stinchcomb per se doesn't apply in the professional disciplinary context. So what I'm suggesting to you is that if you're met with that argument and you've already got a criminal charge or charges in existence with respect to your client, you should consider turning around and using the disclosure mechanism available in the criminal context to access all relevant information in respect of your client, which you can then, of course, use to prepare for the discipline hearing. Uh, in fact, you may find that you can access information which wouldn't otherwise be available to you in the context of the discipline proceeding. And again, I can tell you that it's not uncommon, for example, where there are parallel proceedings for the police to turn over certain information to the professional bodies on the understanding that it's not going to be disclosed to the defense and the professional bodies feel bound by those kinds of undertakings. So in that situation, it may well be that the prosecutor for a particular college will indicate to you that he or she has access to the police brief prepared for the criminal charge, but can't give you access to it in turn. And so in that scenario, obviously what you want to do is make sure that you get a copy of the brief through the, the channels uh, which provide for disclosure in the criminal uh, context. The other thing which Stinchcomb does, which may be significant to you in the discipline context, is that it provides a mechanism to resolve disputes about disclosure uh, in the criminal context. So that, for example, if there is a piece of information you're interested in, let's say it's the complainant's previous psychiatric history, or it may be information about other allegations of sexual misconduct the complainant has made against other individuals. Uh, these days, generally speaking, Crown attorneys are going to refuse to make that disclosure to you for reasons that broadly fall under the heading of public policy. So the question becomes, if you're a defense counsel, do you have uh, a mechanism of contesting that decision on the part of the Crown? And the, the quick and easy answer is yes, you do, because Stinchcomb tells us that the trial judge in the criminal context can resolve disclosure disputes. 
so that you can bring an application to the trial judge pursuant to the decision in Stinchcomb and have the trial judge rule on whether or not this information you're seeking uh, has sufficient relevance to the proceedings and in particular to your defense that it should be disclosed to you despite the Crown Attorney's position and despite the Crown Attorney's contention that there's an overriding public policy concern. The reason I think that's important is that if you're uh, considering whether or not you should try to bring a similar kind of application before a discipline body if the discipline prosecutor has refused to make disclosure. You may uh, be concerned as to whether or not a committee comprised of what I, in this setting, I'm going to call lay people, meaning non-judicially trained people, will be prepared to draw the kinds of distinctions that you may have to argue should be drawn in order to get access to this material so that you may feel that your chances of getting access increase if you can make your disclosure application before a judge in the criminal context uh, and in a setting where judges are now becoming quite accustomed to having to resolve these kinds of disputes. The other thing that you might be interested to know about disclosure generally is that there's a report that's pending in Ontario uh, that really arises out of the work of a committee that was chaired by former Justice Martin of the Ontario Court of Appeal. And it was assigned a very broad mandate to look into the operation generally of the criminal courts and particularly to focus on issues like uh, early resolution of cases and the providing of disclosure to the defense. And although that report has not yet been released, uh, we are told that it is close to being released and I think you can anticipate that it's going to make some fairly significant, uh, uh, or it's going to, to conclude uh, in some fairly significant respects that Crown attorneys are under rather stringent obligations to make disclosure. Uh, and that, uh, that's not based on any kind of inside information, it's just based on a guess given the kinds of representations that were made before this committee. So you may want to, uh, to look carefully at that report when it comes out and see if it gives you any foundation for arguing for an even broader right of disclosure in the professional disciplinary context. The second uh, mechanism that I wanted to speak briefly about which you should know about criminal proceedings is that of course the accused has a right to remain silent in the context of criminal proceedings. This is a right that is guaranteed to him or her under Section 7 of the Charter, and it applies uh, to the pre-investigative stage where no charge has yet been laid, but the prospective accused is being asked to communicate with the police and to answer questions. It also applies once the charge has been laid and the uh, accused is being arrested, so that more commonly uh, it applies during the in interrogation stage, as it's sometimes called, that immediately follows an arrest. Generally, it is also true that the fact that an accused refused to answer questions of a police officer or investigator in the criminal context is not admissible at trial. And in the materials, you'll see some reference to a Supreme Court of Canada decision called Chambers, which is an important decision with respect to that right to remain silent. So it's an important right and it's one that I suggest to you your client should be invoking as a matter of course uh, any time that there's a concern that he or she is the subject of criminal investigation. The question of course that arises is well how can you protect and preserve that right in the face of statutory obligations that say well the professional has to cooperate with his or her professional body. And there are at least uh, two possible solutions. I don't suggest by any means that uh, the possibilities are limited to two, but uh, with credit to Gavin McKenzie for one of them, it has been suggested that in the context of a professional discipline investigation, what you should be doing as counsel is making sure that any information that is passed to the professional forces, if I can use that word, is done in writing and that it is made clear in the course of providing that information that it is being given involuntarily and by compulsion of the particular statute that governs that profession. The reason for that is that in the event of subsequent criminal charges or proceedings, that information then is protected. It cannot be adduced in evidence against the professional in the criminal context. The other mechanism that you may want to consider is one which I have seen being used uh, with the College of Physicians, and I think it's one that has a mixed degree of success, and that is that counsel advises the investigator for the professional body that 
while his or her client would be delighted to cooperate and, and assist in the investigation, because of the fact of this pending criminal charge, he or she can't do so without infringing the charter right to remain silent in the criminal context. And it may be that in that context, in that situation, the investigator will not press for the information. On the other hand, you can be pretty sure that if there was any chance that the professional body was going to decline to proceed with a discipline hearing against your client, that possibility has probably gone out the window when your client uh, has, uh, in essence, refused to provide information to, hit to that body. So it's a solution that is by no means um, perfect and one that I would suggest you attempt to use only where there is very serious concern about criminal charges uh, being laid. Uh, and finally, I'd just like to make some brief remarks about uh, the use of previous testimony because again, in the criminal context, the accused enjoys a particular protection under Section 13 of the Charter, which prohibits the Crown from using evidence which the accused has given in other proceedings in order to incriminate him or her in the uh, criminal trial or other criminal proceeding. And by incriminate, the Supreme Court of Canada has told us in a case called Coldip, which is mentioned in the materials, that that means using it to establish guilt. There's certainly an argument that was advanced before the Supreme Court of Canada that the use of any previous testimony for any purpose really comes back to that one foundational use, which is that at the end of the day, the Crown wants to try to establish guilt. But in Coldip, the Supreme Court of Canada said, no, we have to draw a line between the use of previous testimony to establish guilt and the use of previous testimony simply to impeach credibility. And in essence, what the Supreme Court of Canada said is that if you take the witness stand in a criminal trial, you are inherently vouching for your good credibility, your good credit, uh, and you shouldn't be able to protect yourself by waving around a copy of Section 13 of the Charter and saying, aha, you can't cross-examine me on the fact that two weeks ago in a different courtroom I gave an answer that was black and now I'm saying the answer is white. So as a result, the court drew that distinction between credibility and incrimination. Now, the uh, important thing that you need to know is that that obviously provides some protection to the professional against the future use of his or her evidence at a discipline hearing if that evidence has been given, uh, or I'm sorry, against the future use of, of evidence given at a discipline hearing in a criminal trial. So in other words, if the discipline hearing goes first, the professional testifies, uh, and subsequently there is indeed a criminal trial, and again the professional testifies, the evidence from the discipline proceeding cannot be used in the criminal court for the purpose of establishing guilt. It can only be used with respect to matters of credibility and to impeach credibility. The problem that arises is that based on Wigglesworth, it seems that the opposite is not the case. In other words, it is doubtful that Section 13 of the Charter also operates to protect the reverse situation where the criminal trial goes first, the discipline proceeding follows, the professional has testified in both settings, and the prosecutor for the, the professional body now wants to cross-examine the professional on testimony given in the criminal court. Wigglesworth would suggest that the prosecutor in the professional discipline setting probably can get away with using the previous evidence in this way. So this is another reason why it may be in your client's best interest to take the discipline proceeding uh, first and then have the criminal trial follow subsequently because then you don't uh, run into this difficulty of the use or lack thereof of Section 13. In any event, what this point does do is it underscores, I would suggest to you, the importance of making sure that before your client takes the witness stand in any proceeding, that he or she has been very carefully prepared for the questions that may be asked. And particularly if there is a transcript of evidence at another proceeding, that your client has had a chance to review that transcript before he or she gets into the witness box. Because once there, you may find yourself in the uncomfortable situation of having your client confronted with information given in a previous proceeding which is categorically different from what uh, she or he is, is now saying. I think uh, I'm in fact over the time that I was allotted, so I'll stop there. When you have the certificate, if you're prosecuting a case and the certificate of conviction says uh, 
for theft of an excess in the amount of $1,000 from Shoppers Drug Mart. How do you put in background? How do you establish the guts of it? Because that's, or, and, and can the defendant uh, uh, optometrist lead their own testimony as to say what really happened? Well, Delcori would seem to suggest that, that the professional can't do that in the sense of contesting the finding of guilt. Now, there may be other ways in which he can sort of or she can sort of do it by the back door in terms of leading evidence to suggest that it's not, it's not linked to the professional aspect of misconduct that's now being alleged. Uh, but I think to answer the first part of your question, if there was a concern about having to establish any of the uh, fundamentals that could be done in a couple of different ways, one of which would be, of course, to file a certified <coughs> copy of the transcript of the guilty plea, if it was a guilty plea, uh, or another would be to call the investigating officer. I think that would be called a tour de force, wouldn't it?